special day. It has an atmosphere all of its own. Uh, today, uh, it, it is a profession of faith in the resurrection, as we have just heard from the gospel. He is not here. He has risen, as he said. And today is also a day to reflect on uh, the souls of the faithful departed. And we're remembering especially those who have died in God's grace and friendship, but who still have, as it were, unfinished business, as indeed all of we here do. Uh, after death, says the Catechism, such souls undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. They are still en route, as it were, on the way. Who they are, uh, we don't know and can't say. There is much that we don't know. Uh, there was a little boy who said once, after his grandmother has, had died, uh, I wonder how Granny is getting on with her deadness. Well, well, he might wonder. Uh, the beatified and canonized are the only ones whose eternal condition we can be sure of. For the rest, we are in the dark and we should not name names. But surely we can imagine that there are many good people graced by God, friends of God, who are essentially at peace, but still need some final touching up before they enter heaven. Purgatory makes a good deal of sense. Um, I hope you won't mind this comparison, but imagine a, a car crash. Uh, now, that's an incident, and it happens at a particular place at a particular a time, and it's an unhappy thing. And let's take it uh, as a metaphor for a sin. But the car is repaired, you are patched up, the driver is patched up, and the insurance meets the, the claims and so on. And so the action fades into the past. So the sin is forgiven, let's say and the penance is performed. But it might be that you carry uh, ever after that accident some mental, even, or physical effect, wound. Every so often uh, your neck might play up, for example, because of the, the suddenness of the accident. Now that is a long-term consequence. And so it is with sin. You know, a sin is an act, happens at a particular time, a particular place, um, but often as a result a relationship can never be quite the same again, or one's own resistance to temptation is weakened, or there are painful memories in the mind and in the minds of others, there's some lasting damage. Um, and, and that's what purgatory is dealing with. Uh, think of someone who goes through war and experiences terrible things. The war ends, there's peace, uh, they return to normal life, but there is still a lasting effect. We talk of post-traumatic stress disorder. Now please understand I'm using comparisons uh, and I'm using these things to illustrate something else. Because as it is with our physical self, our bodily self, and our psychological self, so it is with our moral and spiritual self. Purgatory is like the hospital where the effects of our forgiven sins and our lingering disorders are finally healed, where our being comes to its full integrity, where our capacity to love is finally released uh, from certain constraints or it's like the boatyard where you take the boat to have the barnacles uh, scraped off the hull. Um, it's a kind of rehab. Or think of tuning uh, an organ or a piano. Now we are created to sing the song of the Lord as it were. The Lord has been able to play his music uh, on the keys of, of our lives but there's often something a little off pitch in ourselves. 
that thanks to the purifying work of the Holy Spirit, the instrument is, is tuned, as it were, uh, so it responds completely to the music, or the singer and the song are now perfectly matched. Well, those are just some kind of uh, pictures, I suppose, for, for purgatory. But in a way, that's the, just the background for today's commemoration, because there's more. There's very good news in these somber things. There's a great gift for us, because it's not just a question, how is Granny uh, getting on with her deadness, uh, but how are we getting on with the dead? Uh, we're remembering, especially this year, the, the dead of the First World War. But of course we can uh, expand that. And if we think of this, because we who are alive are only a small proportion, a small percentage of the entire human race that has existed, and indeed that will exist. We are one year's leaves on the tree, and the tree is very old and the tree, please God, has many uh, millennia still to go. So how do we relate to the people we have known, but not only the people have known, how do we relate to this great world of the, the departed, the deceased? Well, I think, you know, there's a lot, as I say, we don't know, but the church shows her motherhood and gives us um, many good tools, you might say, for engaging with the deceased. Now, the best tool she gives us, the greatest one, is, of course, hope. Uh, she gives us hope in God's desire for human salvation. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will prepare for all peoples a banquet of rich food. On this mountain, he will remove the morning veil, covering all peoples and the shroud enwrapping all nations. He will destroy death forever. That's a stupendous text, really, and from the Old Testament. This is the mountain of the kingdom of God. God of the heavenly Jerusalem. And out of this hope in God's good purpose for us, we can pray for the departed. When we pray the Our Father, hallowed be thy name, in them, in them, not just in, in us, but in the departed. Thy kingdom come, in them. Can't we pray that? We can pray uh, we can, like Judas Maccabeus in the book of Maccabees, make atonement for the dead so that they might be delivered from their sins. We can ask for them to be remembered uh, at Mass. We can enter out their names in the book in front of the altar. We can offer things up for their benefit. We can visit their graves. We can share in the motherly care of the Church for all who have died in God's grace and are our brothers and sisters. Uh, it, at every Mass, in every Eucharistic prayer, the Church prays for the dead. Every Mass, every Mass, including those whose faith is known to you alone. Think of all the formularies for requiem Masses, beautiful prayers. There is a divine office for the dead. The Church keeps this commemoration every year. Now it's very good that in our society, human remains are in general, properly cared for, disposed of. It's good we remember the dead on Armistice Day. It's good to have graves properly marked and well kept. The church embraces all of that, but she injects the magic of hope. Uh, she gives the software, let's say, for seeking the good of the dead, means for taking charity beyond the grave. Surely there's something very wholesome uh, psychologically in this, that we can go on loving, we can go on relating to those who, who have died. Surely it helps us find peace with those who've gone before uh, to make up for our sins towards them. Uh, just as they are being purified of theirs. And surely it'll make our own dying more peaceful, 
you know, we, we say in the funeral mass, all you saints of God, come and accompany this person to their final home. Well, perhaps when we are dying, some of those saints of God, uh, our saints of God, are in heaven because we have prayed for them. They are, they are anxious, as it were, to return the favour uh, to us as we make the same journey in their wake. We, it's a beautiful reciprocity comes into play. So we talk about hands across the ocean, or we used to. Well, there are hands across the grave. Um, hands across time. So today is a day of empathy. Uh, today we're invited to enter into this, the ongoing cleansing of those who have died, to feel for them, to feel with them, and to pray for them, to be in solidarity with them. The dead are silent, like Jesus in the tomb of Holy Saturday. They're in a Sabbath of waiting, but it's all a preparation for that astonishing announcement. He is not here, he has risen, as he said. So tonight and during this month and every time we experience bereavement or hear of disasters, uh, we can enter into this caring motherhood of the church. Think of those holy women uh, in, in the gospel, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome. There they were going to anoint the dead body of Christ. Well, in a way, we go to anoint the deceased with our prayers. We go carrying the ointment of prayer. But then we hear those wonderful words. Yes, he is, he is risen. So let us thank God for the resurrection of his son and the hope it gives us. Let us thank God for the breadth of his mercy and the hope it gives us.